Kishore, do me a favor and uh, show me the camera so I can see you. Or Liv, show me the camera so I can see you and give me a thumbs up to indicate you can hear me. Okay, good. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Just looking up a term real quick. Okay. Um, I have a verse I thought we'd look at. It occurs in the fourth chapter of the Gita. Um, the verse is relatively simple in that the same word is repeated one, two, three, four, five, six times. So let's say the verse has 15 words in it. Six of them are the same word repeated. And so the verse seems a little cryptic, but if you, if, I, I think we, we'll go ahead and analyze it and then we'll go from there. Um, this format of lecturing online doesn't lend itself so well to a real deep dive back and forth, making sure that you guys have understood all the, all the words in the verse. But I'm, so I'm just going to have to uh, run with it. Hope we're all following along. The verse is uh, Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavi, Brahmagnao, Brahmanahutam. Brahmaiva tena gantavyam brahma karma samadhina. So the word Brahma is used over and over again. Now sometimes Brahma, long A, Brahma, Brahma. Sometimes Brahma, not sometimes, the word Brahma is used for the four headed demi urge, the secondary creator the creator of this universe that is born of Krishna. That Brahma is Padmaja, he's born from the lotus. The lotus sprouting from the navel of Vishnu, he creates the manifested world around us. So since we hear about Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, that's that Brahma. This is Brahma, short A. It's totally different. It's the same word, obviously, but it's a, a totally different meaning. So Brahma. Brahma comes from Bri. Bri is the Sanskrit root that means to grow. And so Brahman is that thing from which everything comes, from which everything grows. There's actually a verse in the Vedanta. The Vedanta is a old tight, concise compendium of 570 aphorisms that explain our philosophy. There's different schools of interpretation of the Vedas. Just like you have different schools of Islam. You have the Shia and the Sunni and different schools of Islam. Similarly, you have different schools of the Veda, different ways of interpreting it. One of the ways of interpreting the Veda is the Vedanta. Vedanta is one way of interpreting the Vedas. There's a body of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a piece of literature called Vedanta. And that is 570 verses. And the second verse is Jamadi Yasi Yataha. Brahman is that thing from which everything comes. The first verse is Atato Brahman Jigyasa, just like the Yoga Sutras. The Vedanta starts out with, now, right now, inquire about Brahman. Brahman is that thing from which everything else comes. 
So even when the word is used in our Vedic literatures, it's used with this understanding of the definition, and the etymology is also the same. Brahman is that thing which grows, that everything comes from God is that thing that gives rise to everything else, that cause of everything that itself has no cause, that first starting point. You can use the PSR, the principle of sufficient reason, to reason back to God, that everything is either contingent or it's necessary. Necessary things must exist and have always existed. Contingent things exist contingent on something else. They could exist or could not exist. Everything in this world is contingent. Therefore, it must have come from something else at some point because there's a sufficient, there's a principle of sufficient reason. There's going to be a reason for everything you find that exists. And so therefore, when you look at this world, which is filled with contingencies that could exist or could not exist, ultimately you have to come back to something which made them have to exist. And that thing which made it have to exist must be a necessary thing, and that necessary thing would then be God. It's a, there's a few more layers to the argument, and there's some uh, arguments against this. And so if you want to really sink this argument home, you've got to spend a little time. I don't want to spend a little time. I just mentioned it. God is that thing from which everything comes. It's the, the one uh, source of everything that itself has no source. It's the, just like the fundamental forces of physics have always existed, just like the fundamental particles of physics have always existed. Similarly, for a theologian or for a spiritualist, God has always existed. He's the first principle. There's always a first principle. And so, depending on what your background is, you have a starting point. And whether that starting point is the fundamental particles of modern physics, or whether that starting point is God, everybody's got a starting point. So, that's what the word Brahman means. So, Brahma, creator God. Brahma, spirit. One of them has a very short A at the end of it. The other one has a long A at the end of it. So, the verse says... Brahma Arpanam. Brahma Arpana. Brahmarpanam. Brahman is the Arpana. Brahmana is the, Brahman is the Arpana, the offering. Arpana, when you offer something in a Vedic sacrifice, then the thing that you offer is called the Arpana, or the thing that's being sacrificed, the thing that's being given as an offering. This language, Arpana, goes back to the old Veda. It was the sacrificial cult of the old Vedas, where the culture was about sacrificing things to God, and so Brahman is the Arpana. So when you offer something, that thing you're offering is divine. Now the word Brahman, I'm sorry, i, I got to slow down a little bit. The word Brahman means God, but it also means spirit just as a generic term. It also sometimes means Vedic literatures. It also sometimes means material nature. In this verse, the word Brahman, in this particular compound, the offering is Brahman. The simplest way to, to translate it would be the offering is itself already divine. So when you offer something to God, the thing you offered becomes divine becomes divinized, becomes sacralized. That's easy to understand. You offer food to Krishna, and by offering food to Krishna, then that food becomes sacred. We offer the lamp and the arti, and then that lamp becomes sacred. There's a transubstantiation in Christianity where the wafer and the juice becomes the body and blood of Christ. And so that's an easy enough idea to understand. In every religion, there's a way of sacralizing things, of making things sacred. So the offering becomes divinized. Okay? Brahma Havi. Havi refers to the ghee in a Vedic sacrifice. So there's like items you might sacrifice, like you might kill an animal in a sacrifice. But then there's also the oblations you pour into the fire. Those oblations are called Havi. Most probably from the Sanskrit Datu Hu, H U, Hu, which means to pour. And who is where you get the word God from. If you look at an etymological dictionary, the word God, the English word God, the German word God, 
usually is understood that that word through phonetics, through phonetic changes, comes from the Sanskrit root who, and through the millennia it became the word God. God, therefore, being the person to whom things are offered. You follow? That's the idea. God is that person that you offer things to. And therefore, the word who, pouring out, became the word God. Um, Brahmaharpanam, the offering is spiritual. Brahmahavi, the ghee that thing which you pour into the fire while doing the offering, that's also Brahman. That's also spiritual. By the same analysis, yeah, when you offer something to God, it becomes spiritualized. It's relatively easy to understand. Brahmagnao, into the fire. We have the English word ignite. comes from agni. Agni means fire. Brahmagnao means into agni into the fire. It's offered into the fire of Brahman. So now the offering is spiritual. The ghee, which is poured as oblations in the fire, is spiritual. The thing which you're offering or sacrificing, the animal or the whatever it might be, uh, is also spiritual. Um, Havi could also, not just, Havi could also be... Uh, Sometimes you offer pious, you offer sweet rice, milk and rice into the fire. And so hubby could also be that. Because that's poured out into the fire as well. When you do a fire sacrifice, an ancient Vedic fire sacrifice, you 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 prepare havisha, you prepare you prepare different types of things which are poured into the fire. So it could be the ghee, that would be the most obvious one, but it could also be the uh, this pious, this, this sweet rice, which is made, which is part of the old Vedic offering too. Um, you take things from the, essentially you take things from the cow and you offer them back. Somehow the cow becomes the vehicle through which this magical elixir called milk comes from. It, you know, it's nourishing. Even though the, the cow eats grass, it gives you this milk. It's amazing. So now you think, you know, cow dung is used widely in India. And you might say, oh, that's like stool. Well, it's kind of like stool, but the cows are ruminant. So it's not exactly like stool. <laughs> you follow? Although it comes out of the cow's anus, and in that sense, it's stool, the cow being a ruminant and, 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 and eating grass and processing that grass through the various chambers of its stomach, it's not exactly like the way we... And therefore, you know, cow dung has so many useful, useful elements to it. Far you know, and it's all far less. Um, what's the um, toxic compared to a stool of animals? Somehow, if you take the stool of a ruminant, it's it's antimicrobial, and it uh, it has a number of nutrients, bioactivated nutrients in it, uh, more so than a stool of an animal. Actually, even the stool of an animal, uh, not a ruminant, but just a regular old you know single chambered. Um, single stomached animal has uh, bioactivate stuff. That's why you find animals eating their feces sometimes and practicing coprophagy, the, the, the regular practice of eating their feces because they'll eat certain uh, plant-based materials which have you know, like phytonutrients in them, plant-based nutrients, but those nutrients can't be accessed. They're not bioavailable to us. So when they pass through their stomach and they're digested, those nutrients become activated, like B12 is a classic example. And the animal will eat its own feces and get a, a usable, a bioavailable source of B12. So they'll eat the plant source they'll, that goes through the stomach and becomes activated, and then they eat it again. Um, but feces is, is by and large you know uh, toxic and, and it uh, is contaminating whereas and so like you know for instance like when the, when the Vietnamese were fighting the US soldiers they would um, they would they would make traps for them in the jungle where you would fall on a bunch of bamboo spikes and then they would cover those in feces and so that way the the wound would get infected um, I've read a number of studies by 
by scientists that demonstrate the antimicrobial bacteria of cow dung. Anyway, so things that come from the cow are all the rage in the Vedic culture, and so the milk was offered, and the ghee was offered, and cow dung was used even within the building of the fire, and so on and so forth. Um, Brahma Arpanam, Brahma Havi. The offering is Brahman, the ghee is Brahman, Brahmagnao, it's offered into the fire of Brahman. Brahmana hutam, and it's hutam, it's, it's poured out. The word hutam is now being used as a verb. Previously it was used as a noun. That which is poured out, now it's being used, it's poured out. Brahmana, by Brahman. So Brahman is pouring out Brahman into the fire of Brahman and offering Brahman to Brahman. Brahman is being offered in the fire of Brahman by Brahman and is being poured out by Brahman into Brahman. Brahman is being poured out by Brahman into Brahman. So it's, 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 it's vexing in terms of it requires an explanation, but it's relatively simple to understand. Brahman is the offering. Brahman is the offerer. Brahman is the fire that something is offered into. So Brahman is the means of sacrifice, the sacrifice itself, and the sacrificer. You follow? It's the object of sacrifice, it's the act of sacrifice, it's the place of sacrifice, and it is the uh, sacrificer themselves. Brahmaiva tena gantavyam. By doing this, you will attain Brahman. The, sacrif the, the sacrificer who is spirit sacrifices spirit into spirit and by doing so attains spirit. Brahma karma samadhina by one who is absorbed in these acts of spirit. Brahma karma, spiritual acts, samadhi. Samadhi means focus or concentration. You hear the word samadhi all over the yoga literature. Sam, a, sam, a, and da. The word da means to place, sam means completely. You're placing your consciousness on something. You're focused on something. You're concentrating on something. So, Brahma, karma, samadhina. By one absorbed in spirit, spirit will be obtained when they offer spirit into spirit. Spirit offers spirit into spirit and by that attains spirit. That's what's attained by one who is spiritually absorbed in that way. So if you're absorbed in spiritual consciousness, then you become spirit, offering spirit into spirit to attain spirit. Did you follow? That's the meaning of the verse. It's a literal. So the verse is purposefully somewhat redundant and paradoxical and complicated and it's meant to vex a little bit and give pause and make you think about it. If you're absorbed in spirit, then you become spirit, offering spirit into spirit, and you attain spirit. Brahmarpanam, Brahma Havi. Brahman is the offering, Brahman is the ghee. Brahmagna, Brahmanahutam. It's offered into Brahman by Brahman. Brahmaivatena Gantavyam. Brahman is to be achieved, Brahma Karma Samadhina, by one absorbed in Brahman. The offering is spirit, the ghee is spirit, it's offered into spirit, by spirit, spirit is to be achieved by one that's absorbed in spirit. That's a literal reading of the verse in order. The offering is spirit, the ghee is spirit, it's offered into spirit, by spirit, 
spirit is to be achieved by one absorbed in spirit. Prabhupada, in his purport, offers almost a literal translation of the verse. He does not offer a literal translation in his translation. He offers a very nuanced translation in the translation. But when translating this verse in the purport, he offers almost a literal translation in the purport, at the very end. He says, anything done in such transcendental consciousness is called yagya or sacrifice for the absolute. I guess it's important to note at this point that this verse uses the language of the ancient Vedic sacrifice to teach. The word karma is related to the sacrifice. The word Agni is the fire of the sacrifice. The word Havi is the ghee of the sacrifice. The word Arpana is the thing which you're offering, whatever it might be, the sacrificial animal or whatever it might be. Brahmana, by the, by the Brahman. That means by the Brahmana, the, the Brahman priest. Hutam, it's poured out, like in a sacrifice, you pour something out. All this language is language used in the old Vedic literature that predates the Gita considerably to refer to the ancient sacrifice. It's technical language. It's the language of the ancient sacrifice. Just like... Uh, there was a, a UFC event that took place yesterday. A mixed martial arts event, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And they had uh, commentators, former professional fighters, and they were commenting on the fight. They were commentating on the fight. And two fighters were fighting and one of them was winning. And then all of a sudden the other one who was underneath, the one who was winning was on top and he was beating on the one underneath him. And all of a sudden the one on top who was beating on the one underneath him tapped out and gave up. And everybody was bewildered. He's on top, he's punching him, he's beating on him. How did he tap out? And he kind of grabbed him around the head, but it looked like he was just kind of holding onto him and hugging him. And they could not understand what was being done. And so they were saying, oh, some kind of choke where you put your fist and this and that, which is it's the name of a choke. It's called an Ezekiel choke. But they didn't even know the name of the choke. And they were professional fighters. And they were trying to talk about the event and they were confused. They didn't realize what had gone on. He had his arm trapped across his body and it was what's called a head and arm choke. They, 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 they couldn't figure it out. Even though they were sitting right there, they, they didn't know the names of the things that were being just done and they couldn't figure it out. I had a laugh because I was watching and I was going, oh, that's, you know, and it was an arm triangle from the bottom. He had his arm across his body, you know, and the guy was tired, so it was easier to choke him out. And he, and he made a mistake. He put his arm across his body and so his shoulder pushed in here and then the other guy's arm was here and those, those two things cut off either side and he choked. But the commentators didn't know what they were talking about. There's a language. They were guy guessing at names and it's not like my son said to me, he goes, can I have that thing you drink and then spit out? You know, my, my, my nine year old, can I have that thing you drink and then spit out? And I go, you mean mouthwash? He goes, yeah. I go, yeah, it's called mouthwash. The thing you drink and then spit out. It's called mouthwash, right? You could also call it alcohol. If I drink alcohol, I spit it out right away. So. <laughs> but in this case, he meant mouthwash. And so there's a name, and there's a name for stuff. And when you're discussing things, you have names for the different things you're discussing. If you get on the phone with somebody and you're a customer service agent for an iPhone, and you, know, you say to the person, you know, go on settings, what's that? Okay, there's an app, it's gray colored. 
it has some like it has a gear on it okay you know oh what's a gear okay a gear is this thing it like it looks kind of like a chakra what's a chakra okay a chakra is like a circle with some spokes on it like a wheel you know what that is yeah okay so it looks like a wheel you follow there's a language for everything so this is a language that's used in the in the sanskrit in this verse it's the language of yagya it's a language of the old vedic sacrifice which is being used to describe something krishna wants to teach and so he's co-opting that language and he's reusing it and he's you know co-opting it and, and, and making use of it to communicate the point he wants to communicate so I, I, that's important to say when you're looking at sanskrit's a language but then within a language, even like within English, there's going to be certain types of language which indicate to you what somebody's talking about. Let me give you an example. Um, if you're talking about making jewelry, you have backings. And backings in making jewelry is like something very specific. It's the thing that you mount the jewel onto. Or you have clasps, also something you mount the jewelry onto. Maybe the clasp is a type of backing. There might be other types of backing. There's posts. Posts are used in earrings. There's clips. They're also used in earrings. The word post has many meanings in English, but within jewelry making, it has a very specific meaning. So if you see the word backing and post and clip and joint and clasp and seed bead used, all in a sentence, you know they're talking about making jewelry. They could be talking about anything. Clasps and posts and, and things like this, backings. They have all sorts of different meanings in English. But when you see all those words together in a sentence, you know the person's talking about jewelry making. If somebody who didn't speak English as their first language would say, no, the word backing might mean support. You no, know, it does mean that. But in this instance, it refers to the thing that sits behind the gemstone. Clasp could mean like, you know, like, you know, anything, like it's so many different uses. Now, in this instance, it means the things which are used to hold the gems. You follow? And so if you know the language, then you understand by the words. So when you look at these words, they're words used in the Vedic sacrifice. And so it's a sacrificial statement by Krishna. The sacrifice and the ghee are both Brahman. The person doing the sacrifice is Brahman. He's offering that sacrifice, which is Brahman, into the fire, which is also Brahman. And he achieves Brahman by that if he's absorbed in Brahman. So if you want to understand the verse, it, it is valuable to know it's referring to that ancient Vedic sacrifice. It's also obviously collapsing all these different items into one category. Normally you do something to achieve something, but here you are the thing you wish to achieve. Normally you offer one thing into another thing, but here the thing you're offering it into and the thing you're offering are the same. Offer rice to rice, into, offer rice into rice. Right? Rice offers rice into rice to achieve rice absorbed in rice. You understand? Rice offers rice into rice to achieve rice if they're absorbed in rice. So the statement purposefully is somewhat vexing. It's using this old Vedic language and it's using the word Brahman, spirit, divinity. So Prabhupada offers an excellent literal translation. Anything done in such transcendental consciousness is called yajna or sacrifice for the absolute. I saw the word sacrifice there in Prabhupada's initial sentence and I thought, oh, I have to explain how this is all the language of sacrifice. You follow? So anything done in transcendental consciousness becomes an offering to the absolute. Here's the translation. In that condition of spiritual Brahman consciousness, the contributor, the contribution, the consumption, the performer or leader of the performance, and the result or ultimate gain, everything 
becomes one in the Absolute, the Supreme Brahman, that is the method of Krishna Consciousness. It's a very simple one-line sentence. In that spiritual consciousness, the contributor, the contribution, the consumption, the performer or leader, and the result all become spiritualized. It's a very literal translation. It's a little, it's a little, the contributor and the performer, they seem like to be a little bit redundant. And so you have to try to figure that one out. But with that little exception of something that would require some further discussion, um, it seems to be just a very clean translation, literally the verse. The contributor, the contribution, the consumption, the performer or leader, and the result all become spiritualized. Now Prabhupada, in his actual translation, is way more interpretive. A person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness. That's his Brahma Karma Samadhina. A person who's absorbed in spiritual acts. A person fully absorbed. See the word absorbed? That's Samadhi. In Krishna consciousness. That's how Prabhupada is rendering the term Brahma Karma. Spiritual action. Here Prabhupada renders it as Krishna consciousness. Krishna does say, think of me and become cognizant of me in the Gita. In umpteen places and so I don't think it's much of a stretch to say well that ultimately means to be conscious of Krishna nonetheless Prabhupada does get a little interpretive in his translation which I think has value because what you need to do is you need to figure out what exactly is intended by each element of the verse because if you homogenize it too much why would spirit have to offer spirit to spirit to achieve spirit? Because if it's spirit, it's already achieved spirit. So I would have to offer spirit into spirit to achieve spirit. You follow? So you, you need to flesh it out a little bit so the verse doesn't become nonsensical. A person fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom. So he's sure to achieve Brahman. If you're absorbed in spirituality, you're sure to go to heaven. See the difference? Although the same word is used, what is heaven? It's a place of spirit. What is Krishna consciousness? It's to be absorbed in spiritual action. A person absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to achieve the spiritual kingdom. Do you see how that little nuance? Achieving spirit means achieving heaven. Right? Being absorbed in Brahman means being absorbed in spiritual consciousness. If you live your life absorbed in spiritual consciousness, at the end of your life you'll go to heaven. That's a very easy to understand statement. Not at all vexing like the Sanskrit is. And still staying very chaste to the meaning of the text. But just getting rid of some of the redundancies which create confusion. When it says you go to spirit, what does it mean? It means you go to the spiritual kingdom. When it says you're absorbed in spirit, what does it mean? It means you're absorbed in God consciousness while you're in this world. See how easy that was to resolve? Just a little nuance in the way you read it. Now, Krishna was trying to make you think. Prabhupada's translation takes away the necessity of thinking about the verse. And so if you were foolish and incapable of fully appreciating the verse in Sanskrit, Prabhupada's translation is, is, is a guiding light because although it kills Krishna's wow, sensational, mind-blown emoji element, Prabhupada replaces that with a real clean, easy-to-grasp understanding, which is certainly valuable. He doesn't cheat you of the other understanding because he included the Sanskrit verse for you to ponder. He also doesn't cheat you of a literal reading because he gives one in his purport. But he felt that it was most important to explain what the verse was trying to communicate rather than staying literal and leaving people vexed. So he honored the translation in the purport, the literal translation. And in the translation itself, he gave a very purported, very nuanced translation so that you wouldn't become bewildered or vexed. And that's, there's different styles of translation. 
You can do it in the same order as the verse. You can do it literally. You can do it poetically and rhyming. You can do a modern day translation, which gets rid of all of the ancient sacrificial language. There's, there's a number of, of different styles that a translator has available to him. Prabhupada preferred clarity. And he sometimes sacrificed literalness in favor of clarity and making it easy to grasp. And he took license to use the entirety of the text to inform his translation, which takes away some of the sensational, sensationalism of the verse, but it does, it does leave you with a very clean understanding. And then Prabhupada being concerned about you know, exactly translating the verse as well, in his purport would oftentimes translate it again, more literally, now that you've been given a clear understanding and you could take that more literal reading and do the math yourself. You see a style? You could say, I prefer a different style. That's fine. This is his style. Of course, if you're part of our tribe, his style is what changed your life. Because his style inspired somebody who inspired somebody who inspired you. And so be careful. Because the genesis of your taste for spiritual life in this tradition and all the beauty of this tradition, your appreciation of it, almost certainly went through the bottleneck of Srila Prabhupada's exegetic work, his, his interpretive work, where he took the ancient tradition and made it practicable and made it practical and made it easy to understand and grasp. A person who's fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, that's the Brahma Karma Samadhi, and the person absorbed in spiritual acts, is sure to attain a spiritual kingdom. Okay, he's sure to go to heaven. That's what it means Brahman is to be achieved, or spirit is to be achieved. So he just killed half the verse. The, first, the second half of the verse, he just nailed. Brahman is to be achieved by one absorbed in Brahman. There's, he reversed the order which is appropriate to do it. That's, that's Sanskrit, the, the word order is less important. You look at the, when you're translating another language, like we use, you know, uh, subject, verb, object. I am going to the store. Sanskrit tends to use subject, object, verb. I to the store I'm going. When trans, however, in Sanskrit, you can reverse the order completely because you look at the declension of each word or the conjugation of each word. You look at the suffix of each word and you understand whether it's a, an object or a predicate or, or, or a noun and how it's being used by looking at the suffix of the word. And you, so you work out the meaning of the sentence by looking at the suffixes of each word. Brahma karma samadhina means by one absorbed in Brahma karma. Brahma now means into the fire of Brahman. So you can look at the ending of the word. Brahmanahutam poured out by Brahman. So you can understand how the sentence is constructed by looking at the end of the words, by the suffix of the words. Um, that's called declension with nouns when you change the suffix. It's called conjugation with verbs. Like como estas, you conjugate the verb estar as estas, estan, estamos, estuviero, and all, all sorts of conjugations. And that tells you what's intended. In English, I go to the store, present tense, first person. I went to the store, first person, past tense. You follow? I am going to the store. And so like that, you conjugate verbs differently. Nouns we don't decline in English. We use prepositional phrases to modify how nouns are used in a sentence, whether they become an object or what exactly is being done with a noun. We'll use prepositions and prepositional phrases. In Sanskrit, you just change the end of the word and it tells you. It makes it the object of a preposition. And you can understand what's being said. Um, a person absorbed, fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, the one absorbed in spirit, is sure to attain a spiritual kingdom. He's sure to go to heaven because of his full contribution to spiritual activities. 
because of his full contribution to spiritual activities. Okay? So that means when somebody fully gives himself to Krishna and absorbs themselves in Krishna consciousness completely, then they're going to go to heaven. Okay? Not exactly a literal translation of the verse, but it does make it important to clarify that if you're going to be absorbed in spiritual life, it has to be a full-time gig. You want to make the Olympics, you got to play your sport full-time. If you want to just do a little bit, maybe you'll win a local competition, but you're not going to make it to the Olympics. You're not going to go pro. No one goes pro who doesn't do full-time. You know? Sometimes you meet people and they have to work a job, but man, they're like struggling to burn the candle at both ends. At a certain point, you have to give up your day job and make your day job the thing you're doing at a certain level because that's what everybody else is doing and you won't be able to keep up. So although it makes perfect sense and it, it's certainly relevant, we're going to have to fight a little bit to figure out what, how Prabhupada got that from the verse. Do you follow? Now, if he did want to add a little something extra in, he's allowed to do that as a translator. He's allowed to take that license. Sure. When he called it the Bhagavad Gita as it is, he did not mean a literal translation from a dictionary. He meant that the ultimate meaning of the text had not been obscured. And he was not twisting the text to say what he wanted to say, but he was staying in line with what Krishna was trying to communicate. Certainly Krishna says stuff like surrender everything, give up all dharma even, and just be surrendered to me. And you'll go to heaven. That's certainly such statements are in the Gita many times over. And in fact, nothing in the Gita ever contradicts that. And that's said to be the greatest teaching, the most important teaching of the Gita. So certainly Prabhupada's statement here is fully in line with the text. But it will take a little bit of fancy footwork to figure out how exactly it derives from the verse. A person who's fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, that one was easy, is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom, that's easy, because of his full contribution to spiritual activities. That could, of course, just be a fleshing out of what it means to be fully absorbed in Brahma Karma. Right? Samadhi means full absorption. So you've got to be fully absorbed. So the word sum actually means fully. So that's easy. We just resolve that one. Samadhi, that the word sum and samadhi means fully. So that's easy. In which the consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. That is homage to the confusing language of the verse. The consummation is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. The consummation, that's the fire. And that which is offered, whether it's the ghee or the offering, which are mentioned separately, is of the same spiritual nature. The only one that hasn't been touched is Brahmanahutam, offered by Brahman, offered by spirit. And really, we could go another way. We could say because of his full contribution to spiritual activities, that means you become spiritualized and therefore you're spiritualized and therefore when you offer something, it becomes spiritualized also. You actually, by your love, by your bhakti, by your devotion, make that thing spiritual. In that way, it wouldn't be a double translation of Brahma Karma Samadhi, not being absorbed in Brahman. It would actually be a translation of Brahmanahutam offered by Brahman because of his full absorption of spiritual activities. And then you have the entire verse being translated. But it rolls off the tongue really nicely. Let's not rolls off the tongue. A person who's fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities, in which the consummation is absolute, and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. Well, how does something material become something spiritual? Because everything comes from God, and therefore everything ultimately is spiritual. How does it become spiritual? Because uh, if the devotee is in spiritual consciousness, then he brings that spirituality. 
How does it become spiritualized? By offering it to God, who's the ultimate spiritual, then that thing becomes spiritualized. So either we make it spiritual, God makes it spiritual, or we see that everything is ultimately spiritual. All of them work, and they work together real nicely. What is this world? This world is spirit misunderstood. This world is spirit infected by our desire to enjoy. When we stop trying to enjoy this world, we find that the world doesn't carry with it any... <sighs> It doesn't carry with it any distractions from Krishna. Properly understood, the world is just filled with reasons to think of Krishna. The rain clouds remind you of Krishna and the sky because Krishna is dark like a rain cloud. And the rain reminds you of you know, the blessings of the Vaishnavas that pour down upon you. The Guru is like a rain cloud, taking the mercy from Krishna and delivering it to the world. And so the rain reminds you of that mercy coming from above. And you know, everything you see around you becomes a reason to think of Krishna and a reason to remember Krishna. Just like wood is burnable because it has sunlight within it. The photosynthesis which grew the wood. It just like with oil. You know, it's like you know, the photosynthesis is available. The sun has stored its energy in that thing. And then therefore you can burn it. It becomes, you know, it, you, there's energy within it. Similarly, the soul is within the body, although it appears to be hidden, it's actually in there. And you just, you know, you can look at a piece of wood and you can think like that. And the world's filled with lessons to learn. And you see earrings and you're reminded how Krishna wears earrings. Beautiful earrings. Lasat Kundala, his earrings are swinging to and fro, so beautiful as the Supreme Lord as he saunters about in Vrindavan. The color blue reminds you of Krishna, red reminds you of Radharani's dress, gold reminds you of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Green reminds you of Krishna, who's like an emerald. When that blue body of Krishna mixes with his with his yellow dhoti, it becomes like a beautiful greenish color. And you know, just like, you know, the colors remind you of Krishna, the numbers remind you of Krishna. Two reminds you of the divine couple. One reminds you of your first business, which is to approach Guru. One reminds you of the single most important thing, which is to be certain to Krishna. Krishnaika Sharanam. Krishna Eka Sharanam. The one thing is you should be surrendered to Krishna. Three reminds you of Triadish, the Lord of the Threes. Krishna, who's the, who's the supreme and is the Lord of the lower, middle, and upper planetary systems. Who's the beginning, middle, and end of all things. Like this. Four reminds you of the Chaturmas. The four months of the rainy season. Do you follow? And so, uh, the material world doesn't necessarily have any distractions away from Krishna. It could also be filled with stimuli to remind you of Krishna. You can bring that consciousness. Krishna can also magically help you, so many, so much so. When a devotee is running forward foolishly in life, about to fall, Krishna will protect you. The Bhagavatam says that. Krishna is so kind, if a devotee runs forward foolishly with his eyes closed, Krishna will protect you from falling. I've experienced this. I've made foolish mistakes in life and Krishna has protected me. Krishna can bring the spirit into our lives. We have a responsibility to try and create that spirit in our lives. And we can look at the world, which is, is really filled with spirituality, if only we would get out of the way and start seeing it for what it is. The world's connected to Krishna, it comes from Krishna. That connection might be remote, but it doesn't mean it's not there. We're connected to Krishna. We can bring that spirituality into the equation. We can be the miracle.
Krishna can also work miracles and magic and just fix things. We can spend our lives trying to fix something, not be able to fix it, and Krishna can just like that. Prabhupada one time said, you know, Krishna gave the Pandavas the world in 18 days. What does it speak of 18 days? 18 hours Krishna could give you everything, but what will you do? You'll just sleep. <laughs> and so, so many times we spend so long working on something and then the stars align and you know, everybody's so concerned with astrology these days. But Krishna is a planet. He's Krishna Graha. Graha means to grab, to grab and pull. Prahlad was protected by Krishna Graha, by the planetary influence of Krishna. So that nothing bad, like no omens and no spells could work against him. No bad, no bad juju could work against him. And so the stars align. The star lines means Krishna smiles on you and you open your heart and you let Krishna in. And all of a sudden the stars align and even bad stars become good. And even bad things become good. And you can see it. You can feel it. So a verse like this, you know, for me, just, just thinking about the verse, it reminds us that of our responsibility. Nothing, it says something about the nature of the world, that the world is connected to Krishna. It reminds us of our responsibility to make that connection, and it also reminds us of the grace of God. All three in one. Boom. There's another triple. The actual nature of things, they're connected to Krishna. Our responsibility to spiritualize ourselves and the magic of Krishna. Brahmarpanam Brahmahavi. Everything is spiritual. The offering. The thing that you're thinking you need to offer to make spiritual, that thing's already spiritual. The ghee you're going to offer to make spiritual, that thing's already spiritual. Brahman now, Brahmanahutam. It's offered into Brahman by Brahman. You're spiritual, and even that thing you're going to like, the, the consummation of it, that's also spiritual. It's already spiritual. It's not going to become magically spiritual. It's already spiritual, if you properly see it. How do you probably see it? Brahma, karma, samadhi. You've got to be absorbed in spirit. And then what happens? Then you become spiritualized. Your life brings you closer and closer to Krishna. If we're absorbed in Krishna consciousness, our proximity to Krishna spiritualizes us. That's His grace. If we're absorbed in Krishna consciousness, we bring that awareness to everything we do. And what is that awareness? That everything's connected to Krishna. Stop trying to exploit it. In the life of a devotee, all three things happen. You realize you're the problem. The world's not the problem. There's no devil. You know, Muhammad says that Satan, there was a couple of verses in the Quran that said it was okay to worship uh, uh, pre-Islamic goddesses and, you know, like pagan deities the pagan deities. And he said that you know, God, uh, the, the devil spoke those verses to him. And those verses were removed from the Quran. This is Muhammad's own commentary. That the satanic verses of the Quran. This idea like the devil's there trying to like, just, like pull you away and there's a devil, and they're, like evil, I'm trying to put it, it's not true. You're the problem. The world's just fine. The world comes from God. The world's just fine. The world isn't ex nihilo. It's not created from nothing, despite what Greek texts may say. The world comes from God, like everything else. Therefore, the world is spiritual. The world comes from Krishna. It's got Krishna within it. It comes from Krishna. It's got to be connected to Krishna. We're the problem. The world's not a problem. All the beautiful things of this world, they're not going to titillate and tantalize you and mess you up unless you let them. There's nothing inherently wrong with this world. It's not a bad place. There's some value in understanding that. That's in the verse. Our responsibility, our responsibility that we need to bring spirituality to the equation, that we need to bring Krishna consciousness to the equation, that we need to make things spiritual, that we need to be that magic, that we need to be that miracle. That's in the verse too. By one absorbed in Brahman. By Brahman is offering. He's making the offering. That's there also. 
We need to do that too. That's an important lesson for us to learn also. We need to bring the spirituality. The, the, they say that you could know a Vaishnava because their presence makes, other, makes others into Vaishnavas. Their spirituality is in, infectious. Through osmosis, just by being in the proximity of a Vaishnava, you become spiritually inspired. They bring the magic. We need to own that so we can connect with Vaishnavas. We also need to become a Vaishnava so we can repay our unrepayable debt to our elders by doing that for other people. We need to practice just so that we don't um, become ungrateful. The ones who walked before us did so much for us. We have to walk also to show our gratitude and give what was given to us to the next generation. Anything less would be an insult. And it would be the height of ingratitude, thou iron-hearted fiend, according to Shakespeare, to be ungrateful. And then finally, there's the Krishna factor. Maybe you could say in the verse, it's absent, it's subtle. Brahman is to be achieved. How is that? You know, by the grace of Brahman. Or you could say it's offered into Brahman. So by offering things to Krishna, that thing because you offered it to Krishna maybe that's the best way to understand it from the verse if you want to pull out grace we're a little early in the Gita for a full doctrine of grace to be given just yet but if you did want to read the later teaching of the Gita into this earlier thing like foreshadowing it's offered to Brahman when you offer something to Krishna that act of offering it to Krishna spiritualizes the whole thing and you become spiritualized and the thing you offer becomes spiritualized and we're going to do that right now we're going to do RT and we're going to offer fire and everything else to Krishna and then see those things as spiritualized by offering it to Krishna, that makes the magic because Krishna brings the spirit. Krishna brings the miracle and that's grace. In this way, you can look at this verse and you can, as vexing as it is, as confusing as it is, it's actually not that confusing. And if you take a little time, like an hour, like we just took, you can analyze the verse, you can unpack it, like Prabhupada did expertly. You go back and you can then read his translation into the original text and there's great value and what it gives us a responsibility, gives us a kick in, the, kick in the pants. It also like reminds us of grace and necessity of grace and also reminds us that this world isn't actually a dangerous place. We're the problem. And it's really, a, a, there's a lot of practical spirituality to be found in this verse. There's a lot of practical, uh, immediate stuff you can take with you even in a paradoxical verse like this, even in a cryptic verse like this, even in a verse like this, which is so many thousands of years old, it's from a completely different culture. Not only is it in old Sanskrit, but it's also, it's also using the language of the old Veda. It's totally cryptic. It's from a completely removed culture, where it's so distant from us. It's 8,000 miles away, half a planet away. It's thousands of years away from us. Well, just a little bit of time, the, the verse is, is pregnant with meaning that you can find value in today with our responsibility, God's responsibility, the synergism between the two, and the nature of this world properly conceived of. All right, um, we're done. We just crossed the hour mark. Uh, so we're going to wrap things up. Thank you so very much. We're going to do RT. So if you guys want to hang out, we'll pause and then we'll restart the feed again and you guys can see the deities and see the arti thank you so very much hi krishna